All right. I'd like to welcome you guys to another question and answer with Chris, and thank you, Chris, for joining us. I'm Mark Malonzo. I've worked with Chris on the Google Apps support team. So this week's episode, epic, would be the <laughs> word that I'd choose to describe it. Thanks. Um, so team practice comes around. You walk down. Colby's standing there with a sheet. He pulls the sheet, and it's, quote, a big, big ass piece of history. <laughs> what was your initial reaction to it? So yeah, one thing that is uh, you know, not always clear on the show is how far we have to walk up to the challenge. So we're a good like I don't know maybe four or five hundred feet you know away, and we're we're walking you know kind of sometimes it's down a hill, up a hill, or we come around a corner type thing, and so. You know, we could see from very far away. We could see Colby you know, standing there yeah. with his, you know, his sort of uh, trademark stance, and then yeah, it's just something big underneath this huge sheet. And uh, you know, remember that we have no idea, you know, what the weapon's going to be for any particular challenge. So in my mind, uh, you know, like I said on on uh, on air, you know, I was expecting either a Gatling gun or a cannon. Uh, at this point, you know, season three is actually in real time. Like while we're while we were running, you know, the 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 cannon challenge, season three of Top Shot was airing, and they had a Gatling gun. Nice. And so, you know, Top Shot tends to not repeat, you know, the same weapon like you know season um, over season. Um, but we didn't know that, right? So uh, I was very excited. To, I mean, because I, you know, I I wanted to be on Top Shot to just shoot crazy weapons, and the bigger the better, just stuff wow. that, you know, the average civilian does not have access to. So do you think you actually would have preferred shooting a Gatling gun or a cannon? <laughs> That's a hard question. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I really enjoyed, you know, shooting shooting the cannon, and uh, I can't say that I would have, you know, preferred one or, one or the other. Yeah. So Dylan on camera said that, Shooting a cannon was the second most badass thing he'd ever done in his life. How, how badass was it, really? It was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that uh, you know, I kind of wish they gave a little bit more airtime to was just the whole loading process and cleaning of the cannon. And um, it was really dirty. It was a really you know, dirty process with just soot and water and, uh, you know, if you looked at Augie's hands during the practice session, I mean, they're black. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was, I mean, in my mind, it was, uh, I was like envisioning myself, you know, like being, you know, fighting in the Spanish-American War and like just imagine like this is what soldiers had to go through to load this type of weapon. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was just, it was incredibly fun. And I think the, you know, the most fun for me, I mean, yes, like hearing like, you know, huge explosions was, was a lot of fun. But I think the best part was the fact that this cannon was possibly in the Spanish-American War. And, like, having that connection to history and, you know, just, yeah, having the opportunity to fire a historic weapon was really something special. So it actually was a piece of history, like authentic. Yeah, it was, they, they said on the show that they believed that the cannon was used in the Spanish-American War in 1898, so that was very, very cool. So there were, there were a lot of steps to shooting the cannon, which was probably the most interesting or fun part of shooting it. I mean, there, how many steps were there? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the first step you do is you, you bore sight the cannon, and so what that means is you literally open up that hatch in the back, and you stand back, you know, maybe like 20 feet, and you're just staring through the barrel. Right. And so what – and actually, they didn't talk about this on air either, but the concept is you're trying to align three concentric circles. So the first circle is whatever your target is, or in this case, it was a bullseye, um, right, at 300 yards. So that's our first circle. Then you've got a second circle, which is the end of the cannon, and then the third circle is that the closest circle to the breach. So the idea is you want to you want all those concentric circles to right be evenly spaced. That means everything's lined up perfectly. But it, it's very much a science. Uh, sorry, very much an art <laughs> versus a science because you're we're just eyeballing it. Right. So bore sighting the cannon is, is step number one. Then. Um, 
Well, assuming that you have a clean bore, um, right, then you can go ahead and load the round, and there are these cool, like, custom-made aluminum rifle, solid aluminum rifle rounds that were made for, for the challenge. Yeah, those look pretty hardcore. Yeah, they were crazy, and they were expensive, too. I can't remember how much they told us it was per round. I think it was maybe, like, $300 per round or something wow. like that. But um, you load the round in, and then you've got this charge, you know, gunpowder charge that's all, you know, packed really tightly. We throw that in. Um, then we had the stuff, it was, it was oil, but we called it, like, butter. Um, so you just you know, squeeze a bunch of this, like, you know, butter oil type stuff on the end of the breech. And so that when you close the door, it cre that, that oil creates a seal, uh, you know, around... Um, you know, around the round. Uh, then you have to take a friction primer and you basically like jab a hole in the uh, charge, stick this, uh, stick the primer in, and then you hook up this cord. And it was really crazy. Like basically, like you know, this pin, you know, the the, the striker, um, um, you know, uh, charge. It's it's just this tiny, thin little little dealio. And when you're when we're hooking up the cord to the primer. I mean, right, if you just, like, if you slip and you happen to just, like, I don't know, like, fall, I mean, you could set this cannon off, and, right, you don't want to be anywhere behind that cannon when it goes yeah. off to get knocked on your ass and, you know, possibly hurt. But, uh, you know, after firing, then you got to open up the open up the, the breech, and then you got to take a, uh, a wet brush and jam it through. Um, and you have to take another brush and put a towel on the end of it and, and jam that through to dry it off. And we actually had to do that drying process. I think it was one wet brush and then two dry, dry, dry swabs. Um, so it was very physical. Um, and remember, like, this is dead heat of summer in L.A. Um, so I think it was like 107 degrees outside. And we were just, like, out in the middle of the sun with, like, zero protection on. Yeah. yeah. So red team practice wise, you guys seemed to do really well. Like, how confident were you after practice? Yeah. So after the team practice, we were we were really really confident about our ability to to fire the cannon. And something that wasn't shown on air is that in practice, that bullseye shot that was that was my shot when I was sighting. Nice. <laughs> and so, you know, we felt we, we felt very good about you know, just our, our team's ability to walk it in. I think I was like the fourth or fifth shooter. And so, you know, as you noticed, we'll to quickly, you know, jump into the main challenge. Shooting that cannon is a process of walking it in, right? So wherever that first shot is, then we can adjust and adjust, you know, keep adjusting along the way. Um, and uh, it is, it's, it's, it's not easy at all. Um, so we felt, you know, really good about after the team practice. And um, something else that they didn't show was both red team and blue team. When we were back at the house, we were simulating that whole cannon loading and cleaning process with, like, broomsticks and, you know, just all sorts of just random things we found around the house. And, you know, we practiced where each of us were in the different roles, right, like adjusting or sighting or firing because, um, you, know, we, we, you know, we wanted to be prepared, right, like we, like Red Team always is right. for these challenges of just trying to game out multiple scenarios. That actually goes into my next question was Red Team seems to prepare for almost any scenario in the challenge. So, but so, like, what, what all did you guys prepare for this time? Yeah, this time we were mostly, we were ready for the rules to allow us to actually choose what roles we wanted everyone to be in. And we actually wanted to actually have fixed roles. So when we were strategizing, I was actually going to be the cider for all five, well, for our number, you know, number of shots we had. But then when Colby announced the challenge and he said, right, everyone has to take a turn Citing that that sort of threw you know our plan um, you know sort of for for you know a little bit of a and a, not a tailspin but um, you know we we had to adapt right um, and so in this case you know I ended up shooting first and uh, you know thankfully uh, you know my target hit you know hit the wood yeah. <laughs> I mean it almost missed um, and and that's sort of the challenge of going first though. 
we had thought, you know, since I had hit the bullseye in the, you know, in the practice, I think we each only had like two practice shots. Um, you know, we thought that I could like recreate that magic, but it, it really comes down to the people at the end, right. the fourth, sort of third, fourth, and fifth shooters um, who have, you know, the the benefit of, of walking it in because we can you know, see, uh, you know, how we're shooting on that day. So when you almost did miss, like how how did you feel after your shot? Um, yeah, I mean, part of it was, you know, I was a little disappointed that, you know, it wasn't closer. Um, however, at that point, since the blue team, they weren't much closer than us. They were just a few inches, a few inches closer. Um, that made me, you know, feel a little bit more better about where my round landed. But uh, I was just happy to, you know, put a round on the target because then that gave us data to work off of. If I had missed... The only information that we maybe could have gleaned was we had both a spotting scope and binoculars. So we had two people watching the target. And if I had missed, we would have had to rely on somebody seeing <laughs> that that 3.2 inch round, you know, screaming by, and, and maybe it was, you know, maybe it would have gone by too fast for them to see where it went. So with the cannon, they, you guys were taking turns, and it was red team, blue team, right? So how were they? Were they resetting it between it? Because it, like you said, it was well, you could step it down off of it. So how did how did that work really? Uh, in the actual challenge. In the challenge, yeah. Um, and what do you mean by step it down? Well, like, like you get an advantage for going first, um, like shooting like well not a disadvantage of shooting first mm -hmm. versus shooting last. Mm -hmm. So you can like learn from your mistakes. I think you said step it down. Oh, so um. Uh, Walk it in. Sorry. Oh, yep. Good call. Yep. So, uh, so, and sorry, the question then was... Were they resetting the, the cannon? Like, how were they keeping it fair? Ah, so, you know, I mean, yeah, after every shot, right, blue team went and then red team went. And, uh, you know, it, it seemed like, oh, if the red team, is, if we're, right, each team is watching each other, that we could get information from, from the other team. Right. But, you know, after each shot, you know, teams, we would be off or, you know, the blue team would shoot, then they would go off in a huddle, and right, they were, you know, tracking their aiming points and their hit points. And as long as we couldn't hear that, you know, that was one benefit. But a second thing is, I mean, with, with shooting, two people could be looking through the same sight and, and be looking at it differently. Or right. I, might say, I might say to you, um, okay, you know, we need to move the cannon... Um, you know, the, the, the site, uh, we need to go, you know, three inches to the 10 o'clock position. But three inches, I mean, three inches, I mean, I, I don't have a measuring, right. you know, stick or anything or measuring tape. So three inches is just like me pulling a number. It's you completely know, sort subjective. Of, exactly. Yeah. So you know, even if we heard what the blue team was saying, I mean, that doesn't really, doesn't really benefit us. And so the red team, you know, we were, we had a whole uh, notepad and we were, we were tracking um, our aim points and hit points that way. So end of the team challenge comes down to an eighth of an inch. Could it be any closer? <laughs> Heartbreaker. It seriously. was absolutely ridiculous when, so I was on the binoculars for that final shot. And when I saw where the round it had hit, I mean, I jumped up and I was just like, I, I was just like screaming like, oh my God, like that is, that's it's just incredible. Right. And so we only had one other person, right, on, the, on, on, and then there was another person on the spotting scope. Um, so, you know, the blue team and even Colby and the rest of the red team, you know, nobody else, right, nobody could tell. Even though I was on the binoculars, I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't tell, um, you know, an eighth of an inch right. who was closer. So, you know, the most excruciating part of that point in the challenge was waiting for, um, there's a, a compliance team as they call it. They're the ones who are sort of the official, you know, scorekeepers, the ones who adjudicate all of the point values and, you know, the judges, the judges essentially, right, for, um, you know, manage the rules. So the, 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 just the painful part was waiting for this, um, you know, for the rules team to drive out 300 yards and, you know, they've got, you know, the measuring tape and they're taking, you know, video footage of, of the target. And, you know, all of us were just, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting back um, you know, just baking in the heat, and, you know, this is the final shot. Right. And this is it, right? This is make it or break it for red team. 
And, uh, yeah, when Colby said eighth of an inch, like, we're just like, oh, wow, you, you got to be kidding us. And then, obviously, when you read off, read off the numbers and when he said, you know, 7.6 or, yeah, 7.6, and it was like, okay, uh, yeah. guys, like, you know, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's about as close as it gets. And, yeah, I think the, the last thing, I, the last comment I think about, about um, you know, the, the challenge was I think it was absolutely incredible to take, you know, 10 people who have never fired a cannon before. And we had about an hour's worth of practice, and that's it. And, you know, 300 yards, which is, you know, three football fields away, that we could get within 7.5, so we're 7.6, you know, 65, right. uh, you know, inches of, of, of a bullseye. And so, you know, it, in my mind, it, it just really, you know, showed just how great and talented this you know, season forecast has been so far. Yeah, it was very impressive. All right, so red team loses. Go back to the house. Elimination range discussion. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, I guess the first place to start is, you know, on air it made it look like I had let off the conversation. Right. Um, we were actually about 15 to 20 minutes in the discussion when I decided to kind of put myself out there. And, you know, when we first started talking about, right, how are we going to go about, you know, nominating people, you know, Red Team, we, we had wanted to, you know, take a performance-based perspective in that particular challenge. But with the Canon, because it's a team, it's a team effort, and, you know, the you know, even though, yeah, like the, the final shooters sort of um, you know, have an advantage or should be, I mean, we, we all walked it in. I mean, right, that was, we all, everyone sort of played their part very, very well. Right. And so we just couldn't, so we literally had, I think, maybe a five or ten minute discussion just on, like, is there a way we can look at the canon challenge and sort of choose two people from that? Then the idea was thrown out there that we should just put our names into a hat and draw. Oh. And I, I spoke, I'm like, no, like we, that is just absolutely the most unfair way that I think we could go about doing this. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, in my mind, too, I'm like, you know, I've, I felt like I've been doing well at this point, you know, in the competition. And like, I don't want to be putting, uh, you know, leaving it to chance whether I'm going to elimination challenge or not. Because strategically, you know, before, you know, starting Top Shot, I told myself, okay, look, like, I need to avoid going to elimination, right. you know, as much as possible. Because why would I want to statistically increase my chances of going home? Even if it means shooting a grenade launcher out or something really badass and cool, and maybe, you know, getting a $2,000, you know, Bass, you know, Pro, you know, gift right. card. Um, but I wanted to avoid going to elimination. And so they write this drawing names out of a hat idea came up and like I spoke up and, and a few others right said no we just can't do that. Then another iteration was let's uh, do secret ballot voting and then if we happen to have like a tie then we can then take those names put them into a hat hmm. and draw. And I'm like well you know okay like that that sounds a little bit better not great. Um, so we actually did a round of like secret ballot. Um, Oh, really? I think we did secret ballot. Maybe we didn't. Um, but anyway, right, the idea was floated around, and it just it's still, like, just, just didn't seem optimal. And it just, you know, Red Team, we, again, like, we had really zeroed in on this, like, let's talk about performance based on that challenge. Then, you know, we started talking about, okay, well, what about looking at past, right, performances? And that's when, you know... My, my foot started to start, you know, creeping yeah. up into, <laughs> into my mouth. Um, and the other, I think the other thing to, to, to call out here is that we were under a time constraint. So, you know, there's only so many uh, hours of daylight, and, the, you know, we need to get to the nomination range for voting. So, you know, there's this time constraint, and, uh, you know, I remember thinking to myself, we are getting nowhere right, with, with our discussion, and I don't, I, don't, I don't think it'd be good for our team to, like, show up at the nomination range and just, like, not really know, you know, strategically who we should be voting for. So, you know, when I let off and, you know, 
you know, yeah, I mean, did my, you know, going around the room and talking about strengths and weaknesses thing. Uh, I was trying to just make the process go as quickly as possible. Right. Obviously, like, that was a, a strategic error um, that obviously, like, rubbed, you know, some people the wrong way. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I guess to, to jump to one of the, uh, the moderator questions, you know, so was the anger from Tim, you know, real or was that contrived or some sort of like editing magic? And it was very real. And that's, that's, that is very much like how I remember it playing out. What was interesting to me is that like, you know, and there was no behind the scenes, like arguments between Tim and I that we didn't see on, you know, on, on air. And so that it literally, I think, caught everyone off guard when, you know, when Tim started going after me because um, we hadn't seen Tim do that before, um, you know, but obviously, like, I struck a nerve and, um, you know, he just, you know, yeah, he came after me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, it just, it was a very challenging experience to try and, you know, manage through a very tense conversation like that. And especially in these elimination discussions, sometimes it can be best to just like, keep your mouth shut, right? And that's... Keep a low profile. Keep a low profile if you, right, like don't stick your neck out there unless you absolutely need to. Um, and, you know, I was aware of that and, you know, I kind of had stayed quiet for the first, you know, 15, 20, 25, you know, minutes of, of the conversation. But again, like I mentioned, you know, when we got to the point of let's draw names out of a hat, like I, I just, you know, no, like I didn't, you know, didn't think that was a good idea. And so, you know, once, you know, Tim had, uh, you know, started to, you know, talk about his throwdown and yeah. wanting, wanting to, to challenge me. It was sort of like, you know, all the vulture heads, right, start, you know, turning my way. And it's like, you know, it almost doesn't matter what I, you know, it doesn't matter what I say at this point that it seemed like, all right, right, someone, someone's, uh, you know, I'm an easy target at this point. And, um, and yeah, I don't know, I guess, what, what other questions do you have? I guess, well, I had a comment, I guess, sure. um, it was really, like, I guess you were, I can see where you're coming from, you're approaching mm -hmm. it just from an analytical standpoint, I guess that may be something you get from working here, just like, let's just hear the facts, but when you deal, especially, well, last week we discussed about Tim being the heart of the team, so it was kind of like logic meets emotion, and they, you, you, hit, a, you hit each other, yeah. and it didn't go so well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess uh, one of the things Gary said off camera, I, I guess you didn't see it until Tuesday also, was that um, he agreed with you completely and he like understood what you were saying and he agreed that it, ha it should be strictly performance based. Mm. Did, did you know at the time that he agreed with you? Like, yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, in the nomination discussion, um, you know, Tim was clearly upset. Um, actually, Gabby was a little upset as well. But then with Chi and Kyle and Gary, I, I wasn't I wasn't sure. They they sort of seemed neutral. So um, yeah, in my mind like I was sort of taking mental um, you know mental stock of okay you know what's the tone you know sort of the sentiment of individuals in the room and it was sort of like neutral to negative, which right. it, it was not good for yeah. me <laughs> by, by any measure. Um, so then all right, so then you guys actually go out to the nomination range. Um, and last week you mentioned that when you guys had decided to, at this point it was decided it, from a coin flip of all things, it was gonna be you and Chi. Mm -hmm. But when you got there, um, you said that you would all, everyone would alternate shooting the two targets. So first person shot you mm -hmm. and then, but then Gabby came up and in, instead of shooting Chi, she also shot you. Yeah, and so, you know, that was definitely something that I noticed, and I was like, okay, that was not part of the plan. Yeah, right, we always just, you know, alternate, you know, that was, that's, that, that was sort of the team agreement. Um, some of their sort of background is that she, and I knew Chi and Gabby um, are, they're very good friends, and so I was like, okay, I can understand why Gabby wouldn't want to shoot Chi's target, right, then, the next two shooters, right, will just balance it out and, you know, shoot, shoot, uh, shoot cheese target. But, yeah, that was definitely a, uh, 
I was like, uh oh, I think some, some something's not off, but let's you know, let's see what <laughs> what what how this unfolds. Okay, so then Kyle shoots Tim's target. Your initial response on camera, you look totally shocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I just wasn't, right, you come out of this elimination discussion, and you're like, I'm stressed out, and I'm, like, also upset with myself, and, like, how, you know, I, in my mind, I was like, gosh, I really just, like, failed to facilitate that conversation the way that I, that I wanted to. Um, you know, and I liked him a lot, and I was also upset, you know, that, you know, I offended him and, and, you know, made him mad. Um, you know, and then, of course, like the blue team, like they're talking to us and trying to understand, you know, what happened. And from a strategic perspective, like we can't show weakness to the blue team. And so, you know, when they heard that we were sending me and she, they went like crazy, like what is, what is going on with the red team? Right. I, I, they're just like, how, you know, right, Chris has been doing well, and, like, right, they, they've been sitting Chi out because they consider him a threat. And, you know, so we had to sort of put up a, a little bit of a facade with the blue team, and um, I forget exactly what I said, but I told him, like, well, oh, I remember what I told them. And this, this came up in the elimination discussion as well. Um, you know, Gary and a few others felt that, you know, I, st I needed to repent for the – first challenge of the steel plate. And so I thought, and that was fair. Um, but, you know, like we just, we never, we didn't have, I think, a full, fair, honest discussion about everyone's performances. But it's a, it's a game, right? So it's not like we're obligated to right. have a fair, you know, objective conversation about, about, about the facts. Right. So Kyle said he did it uh, for two reasons. One, he didn't feel the red team should send two of their best shooters to the elimination round again. Mm -hmm. And then he also said that there was an obvious wedge in the red team between you and Tim. He felt this was an easy, quick solution to it. So I guess after seeing the episode and seeing what he said, do you, do you agree with where it's come from? Yeah, you know, at the time I didn't know. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't know that Kyle was, you know, nobody knew that Kyle was, was going to you know, change his vote. And I definitely see where he, he was coming from. Where, I, where my headspace was at the time, I clearly acknowledged that, you know, I screwed up and Tim was upset. But because it, it had just happened, um, it wasn't like we had weeks and weeks of, like, bad blood or anything between us. In my mind, I was like, hey, look, like, if Chi and I go to elimination and I shoot my way back into the house, Tim and I will we'll figure out, right? We'll resolve this and we'll, we'll figure it out one way or another. However, you know, Tim was, he, he was just clearly upset. Um, in the discussion, after the discussion, at the nomination range, back when we got to the house, and he just like was making it very clear to everyone, right, that this was an, uh, you know, an, an irreparable situation. The only way to resolve it in his mind was, right, for, Tim and me to, to go to elimination. So I see where Kyle was coming from, and I think it was, um, it was, it was, it was great, right? That red team we have people like Kyle and and you know, and others that are really focused on keeping a strong you know team, you know, strong cohesive team unit. Right. So if if you could have personally chosen which one you could have faced in the elimination round, would you have chosen Tim or would you have gone against Chi? You know, I mean, I, you know, I voted for Chi, and, you know, I, I think the rope swing in the, uh, you know, the flintlock challenge was, was you know, it, it was a critical moment for us in that challenge. And if, you know, in my mind, if Chi had, you know, done the rope swing in one go, and, like, I mean, he hit his shot, right, Chi, Gabby, me, we all had our, you know, if we had perfect runs, that would have given Iggy and Tim so much more time, yeah. right, to, to just take their time and focus and hit their shots. Um, and so, and also Chi wanted to go. Um, I guess, like, from, you know, from a strategic, like, perspective, you know, do I think Chi would have been a bigger threat, right, to me or not? Um, I mean, once I saw the atlatl, you know, the atlatl, I mean, in my mind, that was a, a pretty big equalizer. Right. I mean, right, no one's ever, like, I mean, Tim actually had some experience. I, I didn't know that yeah. at the time either. But, you know, uh, 
there's not many people out there that are proficient with the app at all. So G, at, at the end of it, G actually looked uh, so upset. Was he was he crying? Did he feel betrayed by you guys? He really wanted to go. Yeah, there was a lot of emotion that was that was that was going on there. And I, I imagine you know there was uh, you know a little bit of a sense of betrayal by the team, right? That that you know we told them like right, we're going to send you to elimination. Um, you know, Tim and Chi also have become like very close friends, and so. Uh, she, I think, felt that right. Tim was protecting Chi from elimination. Um, you know, Tim made it very clear that if, if you know, if, if, if Tim didn't win Top Shot, that he wanted Chi to oh. win. And so, yeah, it was just one of those like you know, very kind of heroic kind of things that fall on the sword for you know, for a friend uh, type thing, and. Uh, you know, yeah, I, and I don't think in Chi's mind he had anticipated, right, uh, uh, himself not going to elimination. So I don't think he was he was ready for that that uh, possibility. Right on. All right, so elimination practice. Walk up. It's the at Laddle. At Laddle, yeah. At Laddle, prehistoric, right? <laughs> what were your initial reactions to that? I was super excited to see a throwing weapon. Um, you know, I, I grew up in, in suburban Orange County, and, like, there's not a lot of, like, you know, guns and stuff. And so when I was growing up, it would be a lot of, like, you know, slingshots and, like, water balloon launchers and, like, potato guns, marshmallow guns, and, like, very, or, like, you know, sticks and spears and very, like, sort of very basic, like, rudimentary things you find, you know, kind of on the hillside and a bunch of, like, bushes and trees and, and, and whatnot. So... You know, in my mind, it was kind of a little bit of a return to, like, my childhood days of just, right, something very simple, um, but also very foreign. And that was, like, the exciting part of seeing an atlatl. Like, some interesting, you know, kind of behind-the-scenes stuff is day one, when we were all just getting to know each other, Gary, or Gary Pedia, right, as, as we refer to him, you know, he was actually talking about the atlatl. And he's like, I would, I think it would be so cool if they brought out the atlatl. And all of us like, what the hell is an <laughs> yeah. atlatl? And he was trying to explain to us. I mean, imagine trying to explain that without actually like having any of the tools. And he was like, yeah, there's a stick, and you use it as a fulcrum, blah blah blah. And, um, and we're like, okay, like, well, we'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. And so, you know, when you saw a clip of Terry, right, when we came back from practice, and Terry's like, I can't believe they brought that out. It was really in response to Gary predicting that it was going <laughs> to come out on, nice. on, on our season. Um, so I was very excited. But, yeah, also, yeah, just that, that sort of that nervous excitement of, right, like just trying something just completely new and foreign. You know, we only had like an hour for, for practice. But I was very, very excited to see Jack Dagger. He's just been, I don't know, he's one of my favorite experts through all the seasons of Top Shot. And uh, he's just a great teacher, a real funny guy also. I still can't get over the fact that Jack Dagger is a professional knife thrower. <laughs> and not just that. I mean, he, yeah, knife thrower, tomahawks, um, yeah, spears, atlatl. Um, and he's the 2005 Impalement Artist of the Year, <laughs> which is an incredibly fun title to have, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, so right after the elimination practice, you um, you made some comments to the camera. It seemed like you kind of, about being picked for the elimination challenge, it seemed you might have learned from your mistakes. I guess if you could go back, would you have had everyone else say their own faults instead of listing everybody else's? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, I think the irony for me in that whole situation is, you know, here at Google, I'm on our Google EDU, like, faculty team, and I teach a course called <laughs> Foundations in Leadership and Teamwork. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and so, right, like... I study this, you know, leadership and teamwork, and I teach it, and here I am, right, like, making just, like, a critical, critical mistake. Um, and, yeah, you're right. If I, yeah, if I had to go back and do it again, um, you know, I definitely would have, you know, given, given people that, that space to, you know, make their own case instead of me doing it for them. Right. Yeah. So, all right, going on to the actual 
elimination challenge. It didn't seem like anything too crazy, like previous weeks might have been. Just three targets, ten rounds. What was your initial strategy going into that? Yeah, so you know, before and you know, before a single dart was thrown, um, I thought to myself, all right, you know, I need to, I just needed to sort of warm up and you know, get a few points on the board. But the great part about that that challenge was, right, we alternated. So your strategy could change shot by shot, just depending on if Tim misses. In my mind, you know, that would open up an opportunity for me to get a little bit more aggressive. Or, you know, if I start falling behind like I did, then I, I kind of need to go for that easier first target just, just to kind of get points on the board and, and uh, you know, not get, like, demoralized, uh, you, know, on, you know, early on. Which almost happened. So you missed your first two shots. Tim goes up three nothing. But were you demoralized at all? Were you starting to get panicked? I remember thinking to myself after that second shot that it was like, okay, this is this is this is this is not a, a good way to start. And you know, I really just need to you know zero in and focus on on you know, what needs to be done. And um, you know, side 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 question here. So you know, maybe ask the audience here. Um, there, you know, so I had a quote there where Jack was, you know, telling me, uh, you know, to like go to my happy place. And my happy place is a penguin in a cave. Does anyone know? There are two movie references in that quote. Does anyone know what, what two movies Happy Place and Penguin in an Ice Cave are from? Happy Gilmore. Yeah, I only got the other one. <laughs> penguin in an Ice Cave, no one? That's the Fight Club. Fight Club. Fight Club. <laughs> Edward Norton, he's he's, he's in a dream state. Yeah, and the penguin <laughs> slides in the slide. Yeah. Like, wee, or something like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, you know, um, I guess, you know, when, when I was growing up, I played, uh, gosh, I played like 13 years of, of baseball and, um, and a little bit of golf. And... In my, you know, in my training, you know, I was you know, trained to right, visualize yourself, right, like going through right, certain motions and um, right, like just that whole visualization uh, technique. And so that's what I was, I was, I was doing. Um, in addition to just like trying to just have my head in a in a in a comfortable, cool <laughs> place, and so that penguin in an ice cave uh, sort of uh, uh, vision was was, uh, was very helpful. To me, as fun or funny and silly as it may seem. So, did work in calming you? Yeah, absolutely. So, obviously, you know that my, my third shot, you know, finally get some points on the board and starting to feel a little bit better. Yeah. So you got two points, making it three to two. Um, then Tim answered with four, so it's seven to two. But then you came back and just nailed six, taking the lead. And then Tim misses. So you you've come back, taken the lead, and then he misses. What were your thoughts at that point? So uh, I guess maybe for one comment first. So there's been some uh, some interesting questions on like um, top shots, like Facebook page and stuff. So that six pointer that I hit, it was like the majority of it was in the three ring. Yeah. And so the rule is though, if your shot breaks the plane of the next higher point value, then you're awarded that higher point value. And so, right, if you, like, if you watch it again and, like, freeze and just, like, you look very carefully, you'll see that the orange part of that six ring was, was compromised. So, um, so yeah, for, just, yeah, sort of a side comment. So after Tim missed, um, you know, at this point, you know, I've, I've got a few hits and some points on the board. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely feeling good. Um, and, you know, I, I t in, in competition like this, like, I, I just, I, it's sort of natural for me to be very aggressive and, try and get out in front um, as early or as quickly as possible um, and just try and put the, you know, the competitor on their back foot and put them in a defensive position. So, uh, yeah, when Tim missed, I was like, okay, like, this is an opportunity for me to get very aggressive um, because in my mind, if I miss or if I don't score as many points as I, I need to, I guess I saw myself as well. I'm sort of in the same place. Where I'm right. a little bit ahead, but not like terribly, you know, mismatched or off balance, like point wise. I guess that kind of plays into my next question. So you went up 21 to 10. Tim misses again, but we were we were arguing at my house. I would have played it safe and like gone for the short one, 
just get secure more points, just increase that lead. But instead of playing it safe, you went for the gold and stepped up <laughs> and just nailed it. Far, far target bullseye. Like what? Like what made you go for it? <laughs> Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I just, like I said, like when he missed, it was just like, a, you know, an open window of opportunity. And, you know, right, if, if you have an opportunity to just shut something down and just end it, you know, in my mind, why why leave any other opportunities to do so? And, right, if I missed, it's still 21 to 10. I've got like a pretty, you know, pretty good lead. Um, one of my friends made a funny kind of analogy, and he's like, you know, what you did was like, like, you know, going deep, like on a, on a third and second play yeah. in football. It's like, you know, throwing a Hail Mary pass yeah. <laughs> type thing. And, uh, you know, yeah, like I said, I don't know, I just, I guess I just have, when it comes to the competition, um, especially like a head to head competition, there's a sort of a natural aggression, um, that, that comes out, which I think is interesting because at work, I mean, at work, right? Work is very different. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not a very aggressive, uh, you know, person at work and, you know, very collaborative. But, I mean, on top shot, I mean, especially in, in an elimination, individual elimination, I mean, it's do or die, right? So you, you do what you have to do to win. So did you ever think you'd hone somebody with an atlatl? <laughs> no. I mean, especially since, yeah, I'd never even heard of it. Um, but you know, I I was um, I guess some other interesting another interesting thing sort of behind the scenes that we didn't see actually we saw a little bit we saw it was like two seconds on on air was I practiced just I practiced and practiced and practiced after our um, after our, our practice session that morning and uh, you know I just remember like kind of occasionally like coming out of my room where I was practicing and like you know getting a glass of water and like. You know, Tim's approach was much different. Um, he was like just relaxing, socializing, and you know, there, there's, um, you know, everyone has their own right way of sort of preparing themselves. Um, and I don't know whether it was intentional. Like I don't think Tim was. Um, I guess like me seeing Tim sort of relaxing actually gave me a little bit of a confidence boost. Because I was saying to myself, okay, right, I'm I'm preparing and uh, you know really making sure that I've got sort of you know enough practice, if you will, um, you know, compared to, you know, what, what Tim's doing. Uh, I guess the other thing to, to, that might be interesting is, you know, after the, the, the nomination range, that's the end of day two in the cycle. And so, you know, that whole evening was, right, we're back at the house, and we're just, right, having dinner and socializing. And then that next morning is the elimination practice and then the challenge. I slept like crap that night. I mean, I was so stressed out and like the way my mind works is like, I don't know, I'm, I tend to like replay scenarios like over and over again. And I try and think to myself, okay, right. If I did it all over again, like what would I have like said or done differently, even though it doesn't make any difference right. because it's all said and done. Um, but yeah, I don't think I, I didn't go to sleep until like two or three in the morning. And, you know, we had to be up at like eight, eight thirty, I think that morning. Um, but yeah, it was just a very like stressful situation, especially like not having like a very like you know full night's rest. So what what are your final feelings towards Tim? Yeah, you know, um, we you know we we resolved our, our issues out you know on on the playing field, and uh, you know it was uh, such a kind of a fun kind of old school way to resolve things. I don't know, I just I can't remember the last time where I've had a disagreement with like a friend and it's like, all right, I don't know, right, we're, we're going to go play some game and right, the winner of the game, like, you know, they win and the issue is sort of, sort of over. Um, but, you know, Tim and I still, still stay in touch and he's uh, organizing a Top Shot alumni hunting nice. event like up in <laughs> Wyoming where, you know, he's a hunting guide. So, That's pretty um, cool. yeah, I mean, it's great. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, Tim and I still, you know, even, you know, I don't know if you if you pick this up, like during the elimination challenge, like you know, Tim and I, you know, were very you know cordial, and you know, sportsmanship was very a very high priority for both of us, and um, you know, we wanted to maintain um, you know dignity and respect for you know each other and for the competition, 
Um, and obviously, you know, for our friends and families who, you know, are, are also watching. And um, yeah, and so yeah, Tim and I, we're, we're, on, we're on very good terms, thankfully. Awesome. Um, I guess that's all I have. Okay. Uh, anybody out there? This is, oh, it's like John's got, got, got a, a question or on. two on his post-it note. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with bore sighting a cannon, do you have to take uh, bullet drop into account? Uh, I mean, I guess the short answer is yes, but, you know, because we only got like 10 shots with that cannon, I mean, we just had no idea, you know, right at 300 yards, like how much is it really dropping and, um, you know, I mean, yeah, what, at what distance do those rounds really start significantly dropping? So uh, short answer is yes, but we weren't, I mean, it was just all kind of Kentucky windage and us just sort of guesstimating. Else? No? I got another one? <laughs> okay, so I've watched a lot of reality shows, and I noticed that sometimes at the, you know, you can see who they're featuring, like who they're focusing in on, on the camera work. And in the first couple scenes, you know, you're sort of having the one-on-ones with the camera where you're explaining things. You're featured a lot in this episode, mm -hmm. which made me think, oh my God, Chris is going home today. <laughs> uh, and then when you got to the elimination challenge, like, I saw the same thing. Oh, my God, he's going to go home today. So I was wondering, why, why do you think that they're featuring your, your sound bites or your comments so much over the other comp competitors? You know, one, fee one point of feedback that I got from some of the producers was that I, I sort of was, uh, you know, able to kind of narrate kind of the action um, kind of in a, I don't know, more sort of animated way than some of the other competitors. So it, it might... Yeah, it might just be that, I don't know, I said things in a more interesting way than, than other folks. Um, I've also been, like, keying into, like, you know, how much airtime do they give the people or the person that's going to get eliminated in mm -hmm. that particular episode? Um, and that's kind of, I guess, the fun part, right? It's like, I mean, there's no, at least as far as I know, there's no, like, magic formula, right, where it's like, oh, right, the person who's getting the most airtime is, like, going home or, yeah. or, or whatnot, but... And the final one, I don't know if this is a good question or not, but um, for the elimination challenge, who do you think should have been nominated? Because uh, quite honestly, I think you and she are both, well, I don't know about she so much, but you've been like on fire the last couple episodes, and I see no reason why you should have gone up, even been considered to go up for an elimination challenge, because I think you're one of the strongest shooters on the team right now. And then she, you know, he seems like he's in there and he hits everyone that he has a chance to. But who do you think should have gone up? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, the, 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 problem, the problem at this point is we just have a really strong field of shooters. And, I mean, it's like splitting hairs. So, yeah, I mean, I wish I had a better answer. But I, I don't know who, you know, who I would have... Uh, you know, wanted to send because any anyone who we sent and lost, like it, it would have been a loss. Like it would have been a you know a significant loss for us. Um, VC questions, maybe. Anybody VC questions? Going once now. All right. Well, I guess we'll go to Google Moderator online. I guess. It's, you kind of touched on this question, but it's by far the most upvoted question. Uh, the conflict with Tim, how real was it? Uh, was he generally angry, or was it just edited to make it look like a big deal when it really wasn't? Still. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing I would add um, you know, to what I said earlier is, you know, I mean, Tim is a very nice guy. I mean, he's just, he's, he's one of... Um, you know, one of just like the most humble, like nicest guys. And, you know, there's one story in particular that I remember him talking about, um, you know, when we were just, you know, downtime and stuff. And so um, he volunteers a lot of his time um, teaching um, mentally and physically disabled kids how to shot, like how to do skeet shooting, like trap shooting. And he was talking about how one of, one of the kids that he was helping, I mean, he, he was in a wheelchair, and I think he had been helping him for, like, a year and a half. And, you know, after, like, 
you know, hundreds and hundreds of clay birds that, you know, he had shot at, like he had hit zero. And it was one of those things where I guess where it was like, you know, I, I don't know if Tim was like really expecting him to hit, you know, any, any, any birds, but, you know, he said that one day, you know, one of, you know, this kid, he hit one of the birds and like, you know, he turned to Tim and he just said like, oh my gosh, like I hit one. Nice. And, you know, Tim, you know, he teared up and, you know, got really emotional, uh, you know, about that. And, you know, that, that's, you know, that's the kind of man that, that Tim is, um, you know, just really selfless and, you know, someone who's, you know, going to give, you know, going to give his time, uh, you know, to helping other people. So, you know, I guess to the second part of the question with, like, the editing, you know, I mean, it, it was very raw, like, his emotion, and I think, you know, I, it was very accurately, you know, portrayed. Like, I just remember all of us being like, what the, like, what the, like, <laughs> this came out of nowhere, and that's how it came off on screen, and that's exactly how it happened, um, you know, at least how I remember it happening. Um, so, I guess, you know, kudos to the producers for not, like, you know, doing, you know, Hollywood movie magic on us. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, Jason, here in Mountain View, uh, says, was it an, was an elimination match of Tim versus Chi ever considered? The aired segment of the debate seemed to skip right from Tim calling you out to you volunteering to everyone just accepting that for some reason. No, you know, the head-to-head, -head, you know, for T, you know, Tim versus Chi wasn't wasn't really, yeah, a part of. Uh, at least I don't remember it being. It wasn't a significant, you know, focus of the conversation. All right, the third highest voted question comes from Top Shop Mom. <laughs> oh, I wonder who and, this is. Mission uh, Viejo. <laughs> yep, <laughs> my hometown. So. <laughs> awesome. She, Top Shop Mom says, Chris. Are, are, are you and Tim cool now after it's all over? During the nomination talks, it seemed like some footage was deleted, and Tim went from point A to point B in a second. I guess this is kind of a lot like the last mm. question. Is this uh, how it really went, or was a lot of de deliberation deleted? So I guess. Um, I mean, yeah, a lot of deliberation was was deleted, and you know that that nomination discussion. I mean, it, it, there were definitely, uh, you know, there there were. A few few more instances where Tim was basically like, you know, calling me out and, you know, kind of saying like, you know, I'm, we're going to throw down. Right. And some of the other red team members like, okay, Tim, right. Like we, we understand and we hear you. And, and, uh, sometimes the discussion would sort of like continue on. And then other times like, yeah, like the notion was, was entertained, but, um, you know, the essence I think of what happened was, was definitely well captured. How, how long do they give you to for the nomination discussions? It varies. I mean, sometimes, you know, uh, it's 15 to 20 minutes. Other times wow. it's like an hour. Just sort of depends on how, you know, how quickly we get through the team challenge in the, in the morning. Sometimes when we say the morning, sometimes we don't get to the team challenge until like 1 p.m., 2 p.m. Then we're done at like 4 p.m. The sun's setting at 5.36, 6.30. So, yeah, then they need to hurry, kind of hurry things along. So Neil, also in Mountain View, says, after you won the elimination challenge, how badly did you want to turn and yell, what up now, Tim? Who's next? My wife and I couldn't resist yelling that at the TV. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't say that uh, those words or anything close to that you know, had crossed my mind. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I... You know, I have nothing but respect for Tim, and he, he's an excellent shooter. And, uh, you know, it was really an honor to, you know, to compete against him, of, of someone with his, you know, with his background and his experience and his talent. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe it's my, my baseball upbringing that, you know, some of the sportsmanship is uh, probably more important than winning. Um, so I guess maybe that uh, provides some good background to nice. that question. Um, so I had a quick see. VC question. All right, VC. Yeah. Uh, hey, this is Nandu. I was just wondering after the after the challenge was over and you're like walking back before this next episode, were you uh, like already going through your head about how you're going to approach the next elimination discussion and what you're going to go do differently? 
Yeah, uh, you know, and I remember actually one one uh, sort of confessional part of you know interview um, thing that I was talking about was you know I was actually very concerned that if red team goes to you know um, to elimination again, and if the challenge was something similar to this canon thing right where there's sort of no clear you know, easy way of figuring out two people like what's going to happen. Um, so that, that had crossed my mind a number of times, and I just moved my thoughts to, okay, we need to win this next challenge. And so us going to, you know, elimination just isn't, isn't you know, doesn't become a reality. All right. Any others, VC? Yeah. All right. Patsy, I guess here um, from Building 1300, says, I couldn't tell from the camera angles exactly how the atlatl worked. Could you walk us through your pre-throw checklist? Yeah, <laughs> great question. So, um, you know, as Jack had pointed out in his commentary that, um, you know, when I was taking, like, you, you take, like, a very small step forward and, like, I was uh, tending to, like, lock my knee and, and it would, like, throw my shots into the ground. Um, so for me, like, that, the, the first step was sort of positioning my feet um, and it, it sort of exactly in the same way. Um, every single time as much as possible. So that was sort of, you know, planting my feet, sort of basic, very basic first first uh, step. And for me, like, you know, I guess this is from my baseball habits also, where like, you know, if you're, if you're up to bat, and, you know, a lot of batters sort of have the routine where, you know, they'll tap the, you know, they'll tap the far left corner of the bat twice, right. and then they'll do, you know, Swing sort of two things, right? And then maybe they'll tap it again. Um, I don't know. That That's just something that I'm, I don't know, sort of just ingrained in me, too. And so when I was, like, planting my feet, like, I would sort of just, like, rub some, like, divots in the ground to just sort of, you know, kind of, yeah, create these um, sort of motions that, right? So every single time that I have to go up to shoot, that these motions are all the same. So after that, then, yeah, it's, it's, it's holding this stick. And so for me, it was 90 degree. That was sort of one thing, right? 90 degree um, elbow um, you know, to shoulder, uh, and then you're know, holding this, you know, the stick that comes back, and uh, balancing the the arrow on my on the top of my these three fingers, and then I'll, and then having my index finger kind of wrapping around, like holding it right in the same place, same pressure every single time. And this for me was like really the the one of the main pieces was this sort of form and having that down. And then, you know, the throwing motion, it's a very small step forward, and that's what kept getting me because, you know, being a baseball player, I'm used to taking big steps and throwing, um, but with the atlatl, it's like literally like you, you kind of ideally you should be moving your foot maybe like six to, six to eight inches, and that's maybe even too much, like four to six inches forward. Oh, wow. I'm talking like very yeah. small step forward. Um, and so with that step, it's right bringing it down, and then it's this wrist snap at the end. And you have to obviously just get that whole motion correct and, and the timing. Um, it's very similar to, like, tennis or golf, right, where in golf you've got sort of right your wrist break here. In tennis, right, you've got a wrist break, um, you know, in, in that part, you know, in certain parts of, of the swing. Uh, oh, and then the final thing is follow through. It's really interesting, right? A lot, you know, a lot of sports, right? So all these sort of uh, common themes and concepts run through, right? Baseball, golf, football, um, and so with atlatl throwing, you should be ending up with um, your arm crosses over, if I remember correctly, and you're looking at the target, not looking, right? You're not looking down, and not like you're dropping your head down or anything like that. So yeah, follow through is also important. Awesome. Uh, Jason, again, from Mountain View, says, you said you hadn't bought a crossbow, but atlatls are probably pretty cheap. Or you could build one yourself. Do you have one yet? Um, I, I have sort of half of one, I suppose. Um, so, you know, one cool thing about um, the, the production crew um, was that they were letting us keep a lot of the spent brass and like, you know, the um, grenade launcher cartridges, and like we were keeping souvenirs all along the way. And it was so cool that, you know, they were letting us do that. And they told us like previous seasons seemed to not have asked 
or you know, hey, right, can I take you know brass casing or, or whatever? Um, so they gave me, they let me keep one of those large atlatl arrows. You didn't bring it today. I should have brought it today. I know. <laughs> actually, there's no weapons allowed on, on on the Google campus. So yeah, I, actually, that, that's I know that's that's why I didn't bring. I'm like, I don't want to deal with Marty Lev and <laughs> you know, Google security like coming in. Um, but yeah, so I've got one of the arrows, and they were so nice. I mean, like. You know, when I, you know, when I left the show to go home, they, you know, gave me the arrow, and it was in a huge PVC tube, like, all sealed up, and, you know, I just was able to, you know, take it on the plane and, you know, check it as, like, oversized baggage type thing. It's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, right, so, like, such a cool keepsake. Yeah. Like, and, it, and, you know, and it was, like, the arrow, like, bullseye arrow. Nice. So, <laughs> right, it was like so, just yeah. like a super cool memento to have. Um, so I need the other half, though. I don't have the uh, the stick part. But um, if you're following me on Twitter or on, on uh, my Facebook Top Shot page, um, earlier, I think it was earlier today, Jack Dagger, uh, he tweeted the name of and the website of the maker of both the atlatl handle and the arrows that we used. So... If anybody wants, you know, wants <laughs> wants to buy them, um, I've seen them. Yeah, and they're pretty cheap. Like you can get them for like the handle part is cheap as like 25 bucks. Um, the arrows, um, I think I saw like a six arrow and handle set for like 110 bucks, 100 bucks, something like that. So yeah, I think I think I'm gonna get a uh, get an atlatl like throwing deal and yeah, maybe some arrows. We're totally but, gonna have to have an atlatl shooting day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But Ron Garfield, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. All right, let's see. CW from Atlanta, Georgia. I think just registered a couple last-minute questions here. Um, one, I guess I didn't notice this one, but were your socks part of the strategy to distract Tim during the elimination <laughs> challenge? I did not notice what socks you were wearing. Um, I was wearing these gray, gray, gray socks. Um, n no, uh, but I guess <laughs> hey, right? If it distracts him, then that's an added bonus. Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, I like socks. I have these, like, sock monster socks on right now. Like, on the bottom, they're, like, yeah, there's a sock monster base. And, awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, that's a fun question. <laughs> uh, and one, one last question. Gabe from the desert. <laughs> How many pairs of stunner shades did you take with you to the competition? <laughs> That's a really good question. This like leads into the you know the sort of the common question of like what do we carry in our backpacks? And so I think I had four, I had four or five different pairs of glass of shooting glasses and sunglasses with me. My preference are those aviators with like the you know turquoise rims that I've been wearing um, you know for most of the challenges because they're just they're light, they're comfortable. Um, I had sort of like a typical pair of like cheap plastic, like yellow tinted, uh, you know, shooting glasses. I had a pair of shotgun shooting glasses. I actually wore those in the shotgun challenge. The benefit of those glasses is that the lenses come out farther to the sides of your head, so you increase your peripheral vision. Okay. So if you need to be tracking from left to right, or for birds, right, like going to your sides, like you can track it better. Like a lot of glass, like sunglasses, the the rims will will be like here, so they're blocking. Um, some of your peripheral vision, and then I had a backup pair of just sort of like, I don't know if they're Arnett's or something, but yeah, I like four or five pairs of glasses. Oh, well, that, that, that's it on the, the Google moderator. Um, any other questions out there? For VC? VC? You want it all? All right, well, thank you, everyone, for coming, and especially you, Chris. All right. awesome. Thanks again, as always. Epic, epic yes. Sweet. See you next week for the Trick Shot Showdown. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>